Welcome back to Justice. I'm Tishara Halyard, your co-host. And I'm Margot Lindauer, your other co-host. Thanks for joining. Today's episode is a question. We are going to explore it actually with a guest. It is, why is the wellness industry unwell? And we're going to be talking about this from a lot of different angles. So physical being one, of course, but also um, the whiteness and wealthiness mm. of the wellness industry and why that's so problematic for wholeness and wellness in general. Yeah. So we're going to get into it um, and talk about it. But first, the question of the day. <laughs> Caffeine or alcohol? You already know alcohol. Yeah. So I knew this that. This is actually gin. Right. I know. Um, Mine is definitely caffeine. Mm. But would you do like an espresso martini? Yeah, I love those. To, oh, to mix it. Yeah. But I don't think you're supposed to do that. But they're really, really good. Yeah, they're delicious. But I think it's like if you're on a stranded island and you could only have one or the mm. other. Oh, if I'm stranded, why do I need to be alert? I need a sedative. Give me all the alcohol. Mm. I just really love having coffee in the morning i know you talked about like the ritualistic mm-hmm. nature of it and, and you and josh and i drink a lot of hot beverages and it's so deeply comforting i mean i do like alcohol as well but also again sorry wellness we're talking like i do like alcohol but it is not good for you and so There has been some research that has said red that, wine. Well, if you're looking at people <laughs> who live very long and productive lives, they actually do have like a pretty consistent alcohol consumption. But it's is the that because of the alcohol or because they're happy Look, whole people? I don't know the randomized control study that has been done. I'm just, I'm saying, just telling you the data that I use to justify support your drinking. My alcohol consumption. Okay, use what you need. Thank you, friend. Um, but I, I think that the, the biggest thing for me, as you were talking about being at a big age, that has made me slow down a bit is just a high caloric. Um, I mean, you know, alcohol has so many empty calories. Mm-hmm. So that's making me kind of pull back from drinking a, it's a not little the bit. No, because, you know, you, you just keep drinking. You, you just get back on the horse the next day. What's a hangover? You're so tough in that way. <laughs> like you would be down for like a week. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. No, no, I got it in my blood. Dog. And you don't need much sleep. I don't Mm-mm. get up the next day. You just push through it. You keep on going. Absolutely. But I am like, you know, sparsing out those times now, okay. Ma- maybe mm-hmm. until the next holiday season. Great. OK, this quote for dumb shit people say, I think is unbelievable. And I really want to give you the privilege of reading it. Thank you very much. So here's what was said by Congresswoman Lauren Boebert. President Biden's administration is led by this particular brand of educated and out of touch staffers, freshly released from leftist ideology indoctrination camps, otherwise known as colleges and universities. (laughs) So we're not supposed to go to college now? Girl, it is an indoctrination camp. (laughs) It's an indoctrination camp of education. Getting knowledge is nothing but indoctrination. Into knowledge. (laughs) Into being intelligent. Into being thoughtful and creative. (laughs) What the fuck is she talking about? I mean, look, college isn't for everyone. Universities aren't for everyone. That's fine. Right. But if you're going to be a staffer on the Hill, I think the expectation is you understand the division of government and how... Like the legislative branch and the executive branch and the judicial branch right. work in tandem with states. And for that, you need to go to college, college and take a political science course or maybe a law course. I think um, it's a couple things here. My problem with where we are today on the political spectrum, right, and how just things are so completely like siloed and bifurcated. But m- my problem is that in order for that to happen, it's necessary for these people to speak hyperbolically because obviously not all colleges and universities are the same. They're not all like these liberal bastions of leftist ideology. If they were, that would be a great for me. It's my own personal interest. But they're all the same. 
there are plenty of students who go to conservative institutions, who go to institutions who don't have very strong liberal arts, you know, yeah, like programs. Yeah, have stronger uh, STEM programs or engineering, right? Or engineering is part of STEM. But, you know, compute, I don't know. I'm saying everything <laughs> the same. But not everyone gets their bachelors of arts. Exactly. And actually... Le fewer and fewer students are getting that these days because it's harder and harder to get a job. Yeah, exactly. And I learned that all too well with same, an English degree. Same, same. <laughs> so Italian studies. <laughs> Amazing degree. <laughs> so absolutely. Like it's it's one of these things where it really only makes sense to people who are obsessed with this idea of a wokeness and that our kids are going to school and they're using things like pronouns and they're being allowed to identify with their own gender and not what was assigned at birth. Like, right? It's, it's all of this, like, fear-mongering around a changing society that has them absolutely up in arms. And so what can we isolate? Oh, it must be the fault of colleges. They're leftist in indoctrination camps. But is she actually advocating for people not to go to college? I, I don't know. She said educated and out of touch. From these leftist ideology indoctrination camps. And let's just be honest, okay? No one can get anywhere in this society. We've talked about this in a previous episode before, right? Without a college degree at the fucking well, least. Well, I would say there's some entrepreneurs that can. But, uh, uh, entrepreneurship but, is, is different, but right? But in, in these certainly in the political arena, certainly if you're moving up through staffers in federal government, I think there's a requirement that you, gra I think her staffers are required to have graduated from college. But what she's doing here is kind of like trying to harken back, I think implicitly to a time that no longer exists. We live in post-industrial fucking America. All of these heritage crafts don't ex So what she's talking about, shoe cobblers? Like, who is not the educated and out of touch? Butter churners? <laughs> the milkman? <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> I don't even know. But I think it begs another question, especially about colleges and universities in the Northeast or in, quote unquote, liberal parts of the country mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how they're perceived nationally. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's just like the way that our society has become even more polarized, you know, post-Trump, honestly, in that anything that we can use to cause division is what is done on a daily basis. And there are examples that are all over the news of, of places where leftist ideology has taken over some places in university contexts. That has always been the case. the case <laughs> that is nothing new very true think about the 60s oh absolutely college campuses like berkeley for right sure and so the idea that this is new or this is different also is a product of fear mongering mm -hmm. colleges and universities have always been a place of vigorous intellectual debate left leaning and, and typically but not always but not always think of, isn't that what we want like if you can't be able to debate and to grapple with big ideas within an institution of higher learning then where is it supposed to happen right i mean that was the origination of tenure oh i didn't know that that people couldn't lose their jobs for intellectual discourse aha uh -huh, i see i see yeah that that someone disagrees with mm -hmm. it's kind of like the whole mccarthy era, era the red scare you know like stamping out communism and people who exactly. have certain ideas yeah protecting Ex them from that exactly and obviously tenure um and tracking in higher ed has totally changed over over the years but that was how it started and so also also making it this like new thing feels so disingenuous and stupid to me. Yeah, at the same time. And of course, there are lots of colleges and universities that are quite conservative. That, that was my point. And I just want to pause here because oftentimes I think, are we in uh, like a reality TV show that we're not aware of? Is this a Truman show? Because we're actually sitting here talking about an elected official who has something negative to say about people going to college. <laughs> <laughs> why is that even something 
that should be debated nor discussed. You have a problem with people being college educated because they're going to leftist indoctrination camps? And do you think it's strange that she uses the term camps? <laughs> I think indoctrination camp, I have a problem with in general. Like that is a lot. But doesn't it sound like concentration camp? And that is what is- She's trying to do. Do you see what I'm saying? That is exactly the first thing that I thought of when she said it, and I'm sure it was- Intentional. Intentional, and it is nasty. It is so nasty. Also, not for nothing, but if we're going down this line of thinking, right, this is a party, she is part of this newer arm of the Republican Party that has been vocally anti-Semitic. Period. And so using this visual, um, if not intentional, certainly subconscious. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But I wouldn't even give them the um, pleasure of thinking that it was subconscious. I, I, I think that these people are well aware of what they're doing. And that is why, unfortunately, as far as the public discourse is concerned, they are winning. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's all very formulaic and they know where they are headed. And they know what they want to do. And we on the other side of it, it just feels like Mr. Magoo. We're like, Ugh. we're like, how do you respond? Is this something to respond to? We're going to respond to everything. Oh, gosh. Wow. We're not doing anything. <laughs> right. Analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. For sure. All right. So Lauren Boebert, uh, I, I hope that your children, if you have them, don't grow up to go to leftist ideology indoctrination camps. Because, or they do. Or they do. So I have to tell a little story. Not... Um, it's not personal experience, but as some of you know, um, I taught at a university in Boston for quite some time. And though I didn't directly teach this person, there was the child of a very well-known Republican elected. A very high level, position. Yep, high level. Um, and she um, thrived in her women's studies and sociology courses <laughs> and subsequently went to a left-leaning law school. And so I think what we're seeing is exactly what you're talking about. It's just a mind fuck. Like, what do they even mean and why are they saying it? It's certainly not the truth. And it's all for power because some of the, the things that these people are saying, I do not believe that they believe. No. No. Yeah, it's, it's just I don't for think power. So. It's, for, it's, it's like Donald Trump claiming that, you know, walking in front of the, the church with the Bible when they asked him what, your fa what his favorite Bible verse was and he couldn't name one. And he said the Bible. <laughs> All of it. The entire it's Bible. It's like when, when uh, Donald Trump said, the blacks love me. <laughs> <laughs> what does that even mean? The black. The black. I should start saying that. <laughs> the, the whites. <laughs> Go into a room with all my friends and be like, the black. <laughs> <laughs> How are you today? <laughs> all right, my friend. Uh, let's keep the party going. Yeah, let's. So we are so lucky today to have an incredible guest. I have been wanting to meet you, Ashley, for a really long time. Um... We share a wonderful friend in common, Rachel Pajednik, who herself um, is an expert. We should definitely have on someday around nutrition. Um, but um, Ashley is the CEO of this incredible organization called The Courage Campaign, which she started with her now husband, then partner? Then boyfriend? Boyfriend? Yeah, we'll give her that okay. title, boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> um, called The Courage Campaign, as I said, which leverages movement, and the power of intention to redefine one's relationship with fear and attain new levels of personal empowerment. Ooh. That is beautiful. Yes. Um, your work on social media, I've had the privilege of seeing and listening to around equity and inclusion, particularly in the wellness space, which um, I can only speak for Boston and a little bit DC is incredibly white and not particularly inclusive and so we are going to be asking you a lot of questions around that but also more generally about this concept of wellness in a big age mm -hmm. and how do we define it how do we attain it what are what are some of the tenets of wellness that you live by or your you run your classes by and so um anything else you'd like to add about kind of what led you to this work um Wow, that is, it's a really great question. Um, so I grew up with sports 
and and sort of movement and um, all of that stuff being foundational in my household. So my father was a professional boxer and a mailman. Mm -hmm. So he like delivered mail by day, fought on HBO by night, which wow. is an interesting thing because athletes today, like that is their full-time job, right? Yeah. Right, but he had to have a full-time job. He had to have a full-time job. Um, I actually, you know what? I don't know if he had to have a full-time job or if that was like the culture then, but he did have a full-time job, whatever whatever the case. He, he passed, um, in 2012, so I can't, 2009, wow, time. I can't ask him, but he had a full-time job. Um, my mom was a runner, lifted weights. My brother played football and baseball and all these things that I ran track and I danced and da, 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 da. And so everything, everything in my life has informed where I am right now, for better or for worse. Um, but I think that I have so many, now as a mom, I have so many um, thoughts around how my parents parented, mm. which, is, which is, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting rabbit hole to go down, mm -hmm. right? Because we want to be better. But if, if I could take away anything from that time, it's my love of movement, movement as self-care, mm -hmm. movement as a way to be competitive, movement as a way to bring community, um, movement as a way to set myself apart from other people, mm -hmm. um, movement as a girl, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> just, just all of it. When I think of, of everything that's foundational now, it goes back to that. Did I answer your question? Yes. I don't even know. <laughs> yes. No, that is where so, I ended up. <laughs> uh, no, that is, that is so beautiful. And I think will be a great springboard to our questions. But first, okay. caffeine or alcohol? If you only could have one. If I could only have one, I would choose caffeine. Same, same, same. As a mom, oh. because I wouldn't survive. Um, you need it. But pre-Zion, 100% a cocktail. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So yeah. We're, we're, we're going back and forth here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's- A little something for everybody. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> let's get to it. I think there's so much and we don't have a ton of time, so. Shai, you want to start with some Absolutely. of our questions? So Margot mentioned, like, you set yourself apart because so much of your work is not just around movement as a wellness expert and practitioner, but also around equity and inclusion or the lack thereof in that space. If you had to just give someone the elevator pitch, what would you say the problem is in the fitness industry, in the wellness space? Oh, elevator pitch. Um, the problem is we don't value black bodies. And so therefore, if we're not valuing black bodies, we're not valuing black wellness. So why would anyone ever make space for that? Mm -hmm. But I think that what they didn't count on was that black people were gonna be like, hold up, we belong here too. And now, now we're being met with, now we're being met with resistance because we're not just creating our own spaces, but we're also saying we belong in whatever space is already created as well. And I think, and, and there's, there's friction in that because no matter what people say, they're still not creating that space themselves. They say inclusivity, they say all are welcome, but in practice, it's just not there. That's powerful. I mean, so it sounds like what you're saying is that the problem at its root is just anti-blackness. Basically. And the way that it shows up in this 100%. space. 100%. Anti-fatness. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Oh, so I have a question about that, yes. but, before, but getting back to anti-blackness. In an ideal world, specifically in the fitness space, what would you, what, what things or what would you want to see in place to make spaces actually inclusive as opposed to Black Lives Matter signs in front right. of studios? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, which is great. Right, right, it's great, but we know that it can be performative, right? right. So if, I mean, the, if I see a Black Lives Matter sign outside of a studio, I'm kind of like, okay, let me go in. I mean, it's, it's a huge problem. So staff wise, when I come into your studio, is there anybody working there who looks like me? Um, who's not washing floors. Who's not washing floors. I mean, That's, if you're washing floors, fine, but. It's yes, different. but we know that people of color are hired solely to wash the floor. So is somebody who looks like me in a position of management? Are they an instructor? Um, do they own the space? Uh, then going to retail, what are the sizes? Are they two, four, six, eight? Mm. Or are they, you know, above that? Is it affordable? Do you have 
class packages, um, what's the language in the room? How are we talking about bodies? How are we asking people to move? How are we, you know, if a wheelchair user comes in, can you teach to that? I had a woman on Zoom and she was like, she chatted me after class started, I'm in India and I have no equipment, what do I do? If I can't think on a dime, right, then I don't belong as the leader in the mm -hmm. front of the room. And so, God, Margo, it's like top to bottom. It's, yeah. it's so, so many things. So um, I have some adjacency, we like to use that term on this podcast, <laughs> um, to the fitness world. I have been a consumer for many years of different fitness and recently have been trained to teach yoga, which has been- Oh, congrats. An, thanks. Um, I haven't quite passed yet. I mean, I have my certificate, but my first class will be in May, but- um, Well, are you going? Of course. Oh, yes, well, she go. better. <laughs> um, but, but one of the things I was shocked about, and this is a studio I love deeply, desperately, but I think is an issue cross studios, is how little people get paid to teach. So how are oh. we actually going to make this space inclusive in terms of teachers, right? When the training programs to get the certificates are so much more thousands. than thousands of dollars thousands. more than you'll make in a year yeah. by teaching that class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's both and, right? Like we have to have more people in the training programs, but we have to make something give in terms yes. of how we compensate staff. This isn't just for like yummy mummies who want to get out of the house. Right, right. That's, I mean, transparently, if, if I wasn't married to my husband and his salary, I wouldn't be teaching right now. With, with an 18 month old, I wouldn't yeah. be able to afford to do this little part-time teaching gig. No, I don't make nearly enough money right. to support myself. My, right. my so paychecks are like gas money. Right. Mm. right, to get to the studio. To get, yeah, to drive from Canton to Boston, <clears throat> right. which is you know a whole other thing of, of gas and time and energy and effort and all that, which is worth something too, I'm a human being. Yeah. But yeah, it's... So there's that problem. There That's is a that structural problem. problem. But can I jump in here because I'm wondering then, because we're talking about equity on the other side and who gets to access these classes, how do we increase the salary of instructors without passing that on to the consumer? Yeah, or, because or if that, is that possible? I, you know what? I think it depends on, you know, who owns the building, mm. what the rent is, yeah. where is the building, right? Back Bay is going to be different than Brookline, which is going to be different than like a Dedham or something like that, right? So where is the studio? How much are they paying? That's going to trickle down to how much they're paying everyone else. Um, and then, you know, but there are ways around, you could offer, <clears throat> excuse me, my 200 hour, I applied for a scholarship just for BIPOC identifying people and I got it. And so I did my 200 hour for free. Something like that could eliminate a barrier right. for someone. For sure. And so maybe you're not making as much money, but you didn't have to pay for your training or um, or the training might be remote. Or the training might be remote. There are also positions where I know at Down Under we have this, we have instructor managers. So you teach your classes, but then you're also on salary as a studio manager or an assistant manager. So there are some ways okay. where you can increase a person's income without increasing the price to consumers because the price to consumer is also a barrier, right, for right, certain Right, which is folks. also a barrier to enter. Yes. So the other thing that Tashara and I were talking about a little bit um, last night with Josh is outside for people who work a full-time job right. and are managing a home, there's literally zero time to take an exercise class outside of maybe your lunch break, mm -hmm. maybe, or if you have a partner, maybe before work mm -hmm. or maybe right after work. But for most people, that's not their it's limited. Dick. It's, it's limited. Right. And so there also is this question about actual access, like what would it take to get people into the studio? And I've always said this um, over the last 12 years in particular, you know, we need to have some kind of childcare, mm -hmm. a place to put those <laughs> children, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Otherwise, who's going? People who can pay for babysitters. People who can pay for babysitters, nannies, people who have flexible work, right? Um, which is 
a very privileged thing to say, oh, I'm going to go take a 10 a.m., right? Or I'm going to push this meeting. Right. Everybody doesn't have that ability. And I would say that that's kind of the, the privilege bubble that people are in, right? If you go to like a Berries or a Soul Cycle, places where I've taught, because everybody's kind of on the same level, mm. you know? So you don't even realize who's not there or who's being intentionally excluded because like you've got your community and everybody's just like you. And all the moms come to the 9 a.m. after drop off and all the, all the you know, white collar people, they come at 12 on their lunch break and everybody else comes after work. And, and it just you don't, you don't even realize that there are other perspectives because they're not in the room for you to even learn in the first place. So can we talk about how that relates then to poor health outcomes? <laughs> you know, what we see in BIPOC communities around access to wellness or a lack thereof. Well, you know what's even more interesting is like how we can have adverse health outcomes even when we're healthy, mm. right? Break that down, that's deep. I mean, if you think about even just Beyonce, Serena, and Tatiana Ali, right? They're horrible birth stories. And you think about the celebrity and the money and you would assume that they have the best doctors and the, and the most access. And if there's anyone black that's gonna survive childbirth, it's gonna be Beyonce, right? And to know that all three of them came so close to not even making it, it's just, it gives you pause. Like it almost makes me cry because I, what hope is there for the single mom who doesn't have health insurance? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and there are certain, if I can just jump in really quickly, yeah. there are certain states and jurisdictions in this country where the maternal mortality rate is on par with sub-Saharan Africa. So yeah. this is a real thing. It's a real, it's a real, it's it's so real that I, I talk to black girls all the time, black moms on Instagram who are like, I'm not having another baby. Like, I'm not taking that chance again. Mm -hmm. Like, could you imagine, not that you don't want to have another child, but that you don't want to take the chance that you might not make it out of childbirth in America, mm -hmm. right? And so... Well, this goes to a conversation we just had about when we have to rely on systems that, that we don't believe in. Right. Right, so we right. are in this country forced to rely on these systems that have such fundamental flaws, health outcomes being one of the most obvious ones, right? right? But there's so many examples of this, right? Right, And particularly around the black body and the black female body, mm -hmm. around pain, around diagnosis, yes. around yes. mental health, right? That we are so myopic in how we view this issue, right? And it's always coded in whiteness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So y you were talking about like these health outcomes and even if you are perceived to be healthy, what does that actually mean and who defines it? What does it mean to be healthy? <laughs> that is a really great question because we've all always thought of health in terms of whiteness, white thinness. being normal, thinness, um, you know, and, and it, I think the lines are really starting to become blurred and I'm actually happy that they're becoming blurred because now we're also seeing this, you know, we're pulling the curtain back on even what celebrities do. In particular, I'm thinking of, of the medication for diabetes. Oh, oh yeah. did you hear about lose weight. Yes. Ozempic or something like that. Oh, something. Dr. Hirsch was telling us about that. Well, I don't know if she did, but I've heard about it before. Yeah, the people- It's what yeah. Kim Kardashian took. Yes. They're using this medication to lose weight. Right. And now people don't have access to the medication. People don't have, yes. And so now we're seeing, what, oh, what is healthy? Or what is thin? Or we're, we're starting to see that you, that all things are not equal, that you can't just, work out seven days a week and achieve your best body. The, the magazines are lying. The right, people right. are lying. Everybody's lying. So the lines are becoming blurred and we're starting to even see like the marketing around organic food is not what we thought it was. And you can eat frozen food and you can eat, you know, certain processed things. It's not, we're not demonizing things anymore. We're not cutting out bread and milk and all these things unless you have an allergy. So I think, I would hope, that people are starting to think about health as something in their body mm. and to think about it from a genetic point of view, to think about it through their blood work, 
through their relationship with their doctor, that it's not just, uh, you shouldn't be adopting everyone else's narrative mm -hmm. and making that your own because everybody's body is not your body. Oh, this oh, is so deep. This is so good. And something we've talked about in all these, from all of these different angles. So this gets me to one of my questions about a movement that I recently, I, I mean, I knew what it was, but I didn't know it was, had a term, which is, I'm, tell me if I'm mispronouncing it, haze? Health at, oh, any, health, health at every size. Every size, yeah. The health at every size movement, which I think, if I'm not wrong, is this idea that exactly what you're talking about, that you can be healthy and not necessarily look a certain way, yes. right? And health for you is gonna be different from health for me because of all of the things that we know, right? Like I have a high genetic disposition for cancer. There are certain things that I should or shouldn't do that maybe would have no impact on you. Right. Or and it's none of my business, Margot. Like, I think that that's the thing is we're all up in everybody else's business. We're looking at this body and this body and we're saying, oh, she can't possibly be healthy or she can't. It's none of your business. So do you think this is also... <laughs> I'm going to start to get mad. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 get mad because I also think there's something really powerful that maybe our generation is starting a conversation against mm -hmm. where we are trying to decouple morality from body size, which I think, yes. um, no hate on the boomers, but um, <laughs> there is this ideal of, particularly around women, of thinness equating healthy. Yes. Being equated to healthy. 100%. I think that goes back to like a, oh my Lord, I don't want to get this wrong, so I will fact check, but it's, it's a very, um, New Englandy Protestant, oh, yeah. right? Like it has religious affiliation. Mm. Oh, it's like it's I like be it's surprised. like the um, idea that um, withholding from yourself yes. makes you stronger. Yes, like it's Calvinist. the sacrifice. Right. Like, it's like if you the just chasteness. grind it out and work harder and get thinner and work harder, you're going to be better. And what and what is it? <laughs> such a departure from? It is night and day from the black body. Talk about this. Right? So if when, when, you know, our ancestors were brought over here, they didn't look like you, Margot, right? Like not, not to, it's not a commentary on your body, but they didn't look like you. And no, so if you're trying to separate from yourself from people that you don't even deem people, mm -hmm. then wouldn't thinness be an easy way, it's so easy to control, easy in air quotations, it's so easy to control what goes into your body. And so you already have whiteness. I mean, mm. it kind of makes sense. To also to lean also, into thin thinness as a, um, a conversion of blackness. Yes. This mm. is very interesting. So, or inversion, this is so interesting. So I was telling Margo that I am the heaviest, air quotes once again, that I've ever been. Um, I'm about 20 pounds up from my like typical adult weight. And I was telling her that I have not gotten more positive praise on my body. <laughs> like people are people stopping me on the street, dog. No, literally <laughs> stop. I mean, there's lots of reasons why people stop. I mean, stop you're also like literally gorgeous right. and glowing. Right. So all of the right. things that we know. It's the package. It's the, the, whole... the funnier one. Shut no. Up. <laughs> no, but no, but I have been part of this. I actually get very protective. Um, and I don't I think it's also I also think it's a negative thing that black women face way more than white women. Like I think that people feel like they can comment on your body. Well, that's true too. A mm -hmm. lot more than they could mine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't yeah. know if they want to. But um <laughs> but anyway, that is very interesting. It is it's very interesting. Just from a weight. Yeah. Because where... that would not be my experience. Exactly. I only get positive feedback. So can I tell you the opposite thing that happened to yes. me? So um Actually, I don't know if you know, but my, my dad had a wh horrible accident in October and was hospitalized for a really long time. He's okay. I heard on your um, podcast. Yeah. And for, I'd say two weeks, I completely lost my appetite. Not in a, like, I'm trying to diet way. Like, I am in the ICU. Right. Like, driving to Vermont in the middle of the night. Try, right. Like, just lost my appetite, which is weird for me because I have a very big appetite and food is a huge part of my life. I, right. like, really try to eat well and stay healthy. And I lost weight. And 
everyone was like, you look so good. Oh, God. You look so good. And think about saying that to someone who is actively in crisis. Right. Well. So you know what I said? What I would say? I was like, I'm in grief. Right. This is what grief looks like right. on me. I could only be this weight if I stopped eating, which is not a form of self-care, as Tashara says, because Tashara forgets to eat. But I don't forget <laughs> to eat. Eating is like what you need to do to live. Right. Yeah. Right. That just lets you know how, how deep the fat phobia really is, right? right? That it kind of doesn't even matter how you got there. Right, it's like it's whatever, you're, do there. whatever, you're, whatever doing, you're doing, whatever you're doing, girl, yeah. keep doing keep, it. Keep, keep grieving. Keep, we keep love up. that for you. Keep up whatever you're doing, not eating. That's, yeah, we love sadness and depression on you. It right. looks great. <laughs> but I'm also saying, like, I'm getting a lot of, po well, not now, but like I was getting a lot of positive feedback for being the smallest I'd been in a really mm -hmm. long time. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you've gotten a lot of positive feedback for being the biggest. Yeah. So what does that, that say? That is really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it it is honestly affirming for me because my body is changing because I'm getting older, honestly. And also, let's just be honest, I'm on a plane, a train, a subway, a boat, something <laughs> every single fucking week. Right. And I, the last thing I really could, I could not handle additional pressure around trying to lose weight. Do I want to be healthy? Do I want to be well in the way that I define it, as you just mentioned? Of course. And that is my goal for this year. However, weight loss is not something that I can also take on as the highest priority right. in my life. And it's so affirming to hear from other people. Not only do you look good, like go, girl, go, but also I can define health and beauty on my own. 100%. And also, I think what's really important to share and Ashley about your large platforms, right? Is that you're sharing this idea of health looks different on me in different mm -hmm. phases of my life. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Right. It so, it's going to, your body is dynamic. It's changing. I don't know why, where that comes from that people talk about how they looked in high school so or we just how they looked in college. We just I'm like, what? <laughs> We just that talked doesn't about even make this. any sense. Do, have you seen this phenomenon called like dress my mother or dress like my mother on TikTok? No, where where, where mm -hmm. beleaguered mothers in big age are walked down in like ugly sweatpants or whatever they wear. And then they walk back and they jump and then they're walking in with their high school daughters like going out clothes. Oh dear. And this idea of, I mean, there's so much commentary there, right? One, that like, Young, you can only be sexy when you're young. Right. You can only show sexiness in right. one way. Exactly. But why would a mother fit into her teenage daughter's clothing? She shouldn't. Or if she does, if that is her natural way of being, if that just so happens to happen, mm -hmm. that's one thing. But if as an aspiration, right. no and thanks. And why is that the goal? Maybe the goal should be to get a therapist and not to be trying to get Ooh. into your kids clothes and I mean <laughs> that with love I, I mean that look. with love Ashley Mitchell is reading rainbow <laughs> get a therapist, <laughs> get a therapist. Some, no I mean and I am doubling down on that sometimes what you need for your mental health is not another workout it is someone to work through your Ooh. stuff with okay so so <laughs> this, this brings me actually to something that I used to talk about a lot in my clinic. So I ran a domestic violence and sexual assault clinic and I would do um, trainings with my students um, throughout the semester on self-care and what self-care meant. And so um, Tashira has, you know, shown me the, the joy of journaling. Um, are you yes, a journaler too? I am a journaler. Okay. So that's something that I have learned in, in, in the recent past. But I would say to my students, what's something you're going to do for yourself? How are you going to take care of yourself through this work? This work mm -hmm. is really hard. Yeah. And I always knew that they were going to say the same thing. They were going to say, I'm going to go to the gym. Yeah. And I was like, okay, we're going to take the gym out of this. Everyone should be going to the gym or moving their bodies however works for them. But what are you going to do to take yes. care of yourself? Yes. Which includes so much more than just physiology. Oh my goodness. Right. I get into these arguments with my husband weekly because his self-care is the gym every single day. And I'm like, N -n no, I didn't, I didn't fall in love with you because you were a gym rat. I fell in <laughs> love with you, right? Because you were reading, you were journaling, you were listening to things and you, all of your ideas and what you had to talk about. And 
and we and we had a relationship literally because he would take my soul cycle class like he was he would ride front row and so we have this connection through movement but i'm like there's so much more to you that makes you well that makes you whole don't just put it all into this 145 minute chunk of your day. Your day. Yeah. That's not even fair to you as a human. Yeah. That's funny. It should become something else just to check off the to-do right. list. And it's also really hard, right? When you are juggling a lot. Totally. Right, so t there's just not enough time. But I do think there's this interesting question, right? Where we have been taught for so long that wellness is exercise. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Can we break that down to like some of the myths that you find that you have to like bust through with your clients? So I just downloaded <laughs> an app. I won't say which one, but I downloaded a fitness app and but it's specifically around like eating okay. and uh, I, for the first time, have been a lot more conscious of what I'm putting into my body. And y'all, I was like, yo, this shit is so unhealthy. And I thought it was healthy. <laughs> like what? Girl, I'm eating a yogurt parfait every morning, which is basically a piece of cake. As far as the caloric <laughs> intake, I'm putting like maple syrup on my own oh, surface all natural. It's good. Okay, fair. I'm adding granola, <laughs> high protein yogurt. My ass ain't doing nothing to burn no high protein <laughs> diet. So I'm just like, this is not healthy. I'm a fully grown adult in today's <laughs> years old. The wellness and food industry got my ass in a chokehold. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh my gosh. I wish I knew what app. Can you tell me off? I will. Off, I will okay, definitely tell off you. the record. Um, okay. So one of one of the um, creators that I really admire, um, Jason and Lauren Pack on Instagram, um, they have their thing is called like reasonably fit. Okay. So it's like being fit, but literally being reasonable about it, right? And they say think about what you can add versus what you can take away. And I don't know why this just popped oh, in my I'm head, but I'm gonna say it. Like, think about how the food makes you feel. Like, do you need to add more protein? Do you need to add more carbs? Like, do you need to drink more water? Do you need to sleep mm -hmm. more? <laughs> and, and thinking about it versus being like, oh my God, I'm eating this like piece of cake for breakfast every day in the form of yogurt. So what if you like that? What if that is a great way to start your day? What if it's yummy? What if it's that moment to yourself? So maybe you think about adding some protein or adding some fiber to counteract some of the sugar. Mm -hmm. So you're still giving yourself the energy, but you still get to eat what you want to eat. This is so good. Right? This Instead of so like good. saying, oh, I can't have that because that's not healthy. Yes, you can okay, have that. Okay, so can we talk about this, this idea oh, of so deprivation? Good. And do yeah. you know what drives me crazy? When people <laughs> say, I'm so bad. Oh my gosh, I'm yes. so I'm so bad, I had blah, blah, blah. Or let's be bad. Yeah. Let's yeah. be bad and eat dinner. <laughs> the language alone is problematic. Right, it but is. it's also, it it's conditioning, right? Mm -hmm. We are not bad for needing to eat. Yes. <laughs> or wanting to eat certain things because food is love and memories and... Right. And it tastes good good mm -hmm. right uh, and it's comforting and whatever right it's nutritious it's all the right. things it's not bad it's not bad it's and not inherently bad it's not yes. inherently bad so that's something that really um drives me crazy it drives me nuts too or or like when people will show up to class and say like oh i had pizza last night so i have to burn a lot of calories and i'm like yeah, it, it actually literally doesn't even work that way right so you're <laughs> right you might want to make an appointment with your therapist. <laughs> we are back to mental health. Okay, so, okay, so we need to go back to two things. Yes. Um, have you watched Abbott Elementary? Yes. Um, okay. Do you know the episode where um, the teacher, the main protagonist, sees a friend from high school who's picking up her nephew, and there's the other mom there who's really in shape and she, anyway it doesn't matter but this woman <laughs> is like has a really nice figure and there's like oh she's a bad bitch she's a bad bitch and then there's this whole thing about well she must do pilates <laughs> right and this idea of mm. also um we were talking about this last night with my husband josh because i took him to a pilates class a couple months ago oh, and <laughs> and he so he is um also someone who is inherently really dedicated to movement. He was a competitive skier, he coaches mm. skiing, he was a competitive 
ultimate frisbee player. Oh, um, hey. <laughs> okay. For him. He bikes to work, whatever. He's always moving just naturally. Yeah. And um, he was like, you're paying for this? <laughs> it was so funny when he imitated Pilates. I fell out. I was he, like, was like, he was exactly like, what it is. And, and He's I, like. <laughs> and it was it was a little offensive because um, I, I too go to Pilates, like to share with someone okay. who is a physical therapist. Okay. Um, it has been incredibly important for my regaining mobility after my surgeries. Um, but it is not vigorous exercise in the way that he might define it right but there is also this thing about pilates what is that what is like the, these fad exercises i you, honestly i don't know you're not going to get in shape by doing pilates you're, you're going to regain mobility you can get some core strength everything offers you something a little bit different right but i would say that if you if you were going to go off of like national health recommendations right of like 150 minutes of exercise per week. You're supposed to, you're supposed to, I'm putting this in air quotes for everybody listening because please don't, don't come for me saying whatever. It says two days of strength training per week. Um, so that means weights, mm -hmm. which Pilates doesn't have. Um, well, some, never mind. We won't even go there. Right. Um, some do. Some but do, yeah. but we won't go there. Um, and then you want to be also training your heart right? The rest of those days. Sometimes you can do really like vigorous heart training, running, jumping, taking a hit class. And sometimes you're going to not, right? Sometimes you're going to be taking a walk. Sometimes you might take a dance class. I feel like Pilates could fall. Mm -hmm. So it's what I, as a practitioner, would I say, oh, do Pilates five days a week. That should be your whole movement practice. I, I don't think that it's as well-rounded of a practice as okay. it could be. Mm. But do I think that there's value in taking a class or two per week? Absolutely. Thank you. So then let, I, this then begs the next question. I know everyone is very individual, yes. but what would you say that you have found more like well-rounded, holistic kind of exercise practices or movement practices to be? Thank you for asking that. I think that my answer pre-baby would have been totally different. But now I'm, I have like a, a really, and I'm using myself as an example, okay. um, a really great mix of strength training, cardio, and yoga. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much all I do. Um, my cardio will be spin. I'm, I'm a huge Peloton girl. Ooh. Um, Who's I'm, your favorite? Is it Allie Miss Love? No, it's not actually. She's not my favorite. I, she's I wouldn't. Favorite. I wouldn't say that to her face because <laughs> she's, she's wonderful. Yeah. And there's no shade, but she's not my favorite. I, I had to stop following Robin because it was too intense. It. You know what? I had to. Robin got cut off for me during pregnancy because we were pregnant at the same time, uh -huh. and I found her messaging to be she like. She was doing a lot. She was doing a lot. Yeah. Okay. And I was like, I also do this for a living, Robin, and I think that what you're putting out there is. Yeah potentially harmful and the way she came back could be potentially harmful yeah. also well whatever I'd different say. you know do what's best at your address but yeah. mm. um peloton who do i love if i'm biking i love um tune day oh i love her obviously i love tune day and i love cody so same i same. think that i think that um I'm gonna go you know strength training getting some heart training and then absolutely margo to your point getting mobility training stretching lengthening muscles doing doing things that are slower, maybe more restorative. I, I think that, I think it's great. I also think we all have, like with anything, right, in this phase of our lives, we all have very different ways that we spend the day. Yes. And so we have to be cognizant of how we're moving or not moving our bodies. If you're sitting at a computer all day, you need to think about your spine mm -hmm. and how it's maybe turned forward and to stretch it. And to if you've had pelvic issues, if you're a runner and you might have hip flexor issues, yeah. right? If yeah. you have had previous injuries, right? Those are gonna become more exacerbated over time. If you have asthma, if you live in a apartment that has mold or has, you know, some pollution issues, which we know, again, if we're talking about social determinants of health, like how you're gonna be able to move your body in those spaces is just gonna be different. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I think my takeaway, Ashley, from your movement suggestion is like a lot of the things we've been talking about is think about how you can do it, what works for you, right. and try to incorporate it. Right. And I, would, I, I do realize that depending on where you are, 
it can really be a barrier. Do you have a gym membership? Does your neighborhood feel safe to run in? Yeah. Are there, yeah, are there trees? Or is your neighborhood maybe safe to run in, but you're black and you're just scared to death that somebody might come shoot and you? shoot you and kill you, yeah, literally for no reason other than being black. It literally happened. So, you know, like, I, when I say these things, it might sound like I'm not taking into consideration certain barriers that people face. I am. And I'm saying that a plan helps if you really sit down and think about it, kind of like with anything else. Um, what I do, do that. Yeah, what I plan do you out my week to? and my workouts. Pla I totally do too. I find it very comforting, actually. I was saying, um, I was saying to the studio owner at Breathe, that's where I practice. Oh, um, that's right next yeah. to down there. Okay. Um, that particularly, what my 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 dad was hospitalized, and then they moved in with us for a number of weeks, and. I found it really comforting while they were with us to plan out my workout so I could have coverage for my yes. dad's care. Yes. Um, and it was a time for me to get out of the house too. And so I think that's a, a really great suggestion. Okay, I know we have to wrap up, but I wanna get back to your equity work in this space and working with spaces that are have white dominant norms and are, I don't know if, I, I think I can say this, but tell me if I'm wrong. Um, skew uh, female, heteronormative, and younger, um, and doing the work that you do. Do you find that your work is met with fear? And sometimes. And how do you navigate that? I mean, I just want to say that I was listening to something you said yesterday. Oh, I, I was think. going. And you yesterday. said something <laughs> about no, no, no. But I, I thought that this, this um, sat well with me, and I, I, I want to hear what you meant by that. This, yeah. and you said something to the effect of, "Black people are not here to center your comfort." Yes. What did you mean by that? I think I know what you mean, but I would love you to elaborate, particularly in this space. I, yes. I, I yeah. mean, we can move it into all spaces, honestly. Yes, but, we, we can. Right. So, this, this person that I was referring to is actually in the wellness industry also. Mm. And she responded to uh, a reel that I had made and saying, instead of yelling at white girls and, and like telling them what they're not doing, why don't you tell us what we should be doing and how we can help and you know provide resources. And so my response, black people are not here to center your comfort you do the work mm -hmm. of finding the resources. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, people have been doing this equity work for so long before I've even was a thought of a human, right? But particularly since 2020, there are so many folks providing resources, speaking, there are books, articles, there's, there are no shortage of ways to learn. So for her to, and others, to assume that it's my job to provide it to, to her. provide that for her so she can be comfortable in her non-action in the first place absolutely not yeah. absolutely not this this often reminds me of what i say which is that a lot of the equity resources i think the black folks will naturally show up and be invested but that work is not for us no it is not no. for us at all so thank you for that thank you. i, think I also i point. also i also think you know we've been talking about individual individual responsibility towards activism and what does that look like in systems that oppress or in systems that are slow moving to share in another episode used the um, visual that is sticking with me of a ship that we're all trying to turn around and we're all going to turn it differently and i just think of actual tangible ways that individual instructors and studios and places of movement can make those spaces more welcoming and more accessible and it's not that hard not that hard and you should absolutely be hiring a consultant and paying someone really well to come help you turn your ship it's that simple ashley's information will be in the show notes to help absolutely turn your Fo ship <laughs> follow her at black girl magic mama um for some really great content that she's sharing for free um i'm just putting that out there <laughs> and you. some great content um with a very 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 adorable toddler um <laughs> 
And I would love to continue this conversation, actually, because I think, you know, we're focusing on women and femmes in this bigger phase of life, but we don't have a lot of role models of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So let's keep talking. Absolutely. Thank you for being here. So that episode was heavy and really interesting. I'm hoping that we can keep talking about this because one of the focuses, one of the foci, (laughs) one of the things we're focusing on this season and seasons to come is wellness and wellness generally. What is that at a big age? And so the fitness space and the wellness space is, is expansive and is touching all of us in different ways. And so we need to deconstruct it and try to find a place for all of us. Mm, I love that word deconstructed. Yeah. Because I mean, as we mentioned during the episode, so much of this drives health disparities. Totally. Yeah. And I think if we are going to have um, equity on the other side and allow for people to live healthy lives, it takes having these conversations. Yeah. And we also need to reconceptualize what we think of as, you know, yesterday, sorry, what we think of as wellness. Yesterday, I don't know what we were talking about, but I said something like, well, I should really go for a run. And you were like, all you need is to walk for 30 minutes. Close those rings Close on your those Apple Watch. Rings. And um, it's true. What we think of as exercise might not be what our body needs. Absolutely. Or meet our personal goals. All of this is so incredibly personal. Right. And so we'll keep talking. But what is something you're going to do for yourself? Uh, for myself, although I may not get a lot of enjoyment out of it, but this episode reminded me what you say all the time, which is that I need to be drinking more water. Mm, so yeah. you know what? I'm just about to flood the gates of my body for the rest of the day, pee a whole lot. I'm going to die. And on my tombstone, someone's going to write, she told us to drink water. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you are not my only friend and family that is exhausted by... Maybe we'll do an episode on water. On water. I mean, you say this to me all the time. I really don't think, Shy, you're drinking enough water. (laughs) Drink water. So I'm going to take it under advisement. Okay, take it under advisement. Maybe I'm drinking too much water. I I don't don't think think so. so. Um, And what is something I'm going to do? I'm going to exercise today. Oh, good for you. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something, something outside so maybe i'll go for a walk okay maybe i'll take the dog for a walk oh uh, you're not taking bingo for a walk you hate that dog no <laughs> to shira i have worked so hard on my relationship with my dog you haven't noticed i noticed that now you don't curse him out you just ignore him <laughs> to shira <laughs> okay I'm look sorry. everyone look everyone I'm sorry. i like my dog and um, i'm a basketball fan and we're just gonna put it there period so till the next episode Go Celtics. Go, I bleed green. (laughs) And go bingo. And go bingo. Go bingo, go. (laughs) All right, bye y'all. Peace.